would you have parents, regular Nigerians, what would you have them do? They have their children taken away. They see Gumi as the savior. They don't have a choice. What would I you don't, have them I do? don't, I don't in I'm, any way. I'm, so I'm saying this because yes. it appears that our military, they are overwhelmed. It, they, it appears they are not All able right. to handle the situation. So people no longer have I don't. Choice. I don't blame, I listen, I do not blame in any, you know, shape or form. Do I blame the parents mm. of um, anybody that has been kidnapped to do whatever it takes to get their child back? You can understand that it's perfectly understandable mm. for them to have that inclination. You will go anywhere to get your child back. Anybody would. And do anything to get your child back. Anybody would. And frankly speaking, it's not the parent's job to protect the child from terrorists. It's the government's job. And when the government has failed in that, you can understand the, gov the parent will say, well, look, the government has failed us uh, in, in protecting. We have to do whatever it is to get our children. So I don't blame them for that. The people I blame are those that take advantage of that emotion and that sentiment and say, listen, government has failed. We know this. Come to me. I have the answer. Meanwhile, you have a very person that is creating the problem for them in the first place. It's called, you know, when you talk about Illuminati, you, you will understand this. <laughs> it's called problem, reaction, solution. You create the problem. There's a reaction to that problem. And the very people that it's affected will come say, please find a solution for us. Say, oh, yeah, I have the solution. Meanwhile, you created the problem. And this is what's going on here. This is what people like Gumi are doing, in my view. And, um, and, and this is why it's so unacceptable. But I do not blame the parents for having, that, for having that sentiment and that view. It's understandable, given the circumstances. It's left to the state, that is the president, the armed forces, and the various governors in the various states, to do far more than they're doing. And I'm, I'm using the opportunity to call them out on this thing. There are a few that are doing exceptionally well in terms of fighting terrorism. I can tell you this, I've said it over and over again. Go to Kogi State, that the, the governor takes a personal lead. I know this because I've seen it. I've been there. A personal lead in going after these people. He goes himself. His local government area chairmen go into the forest themselves. And they you know, they ensure they do the right thing to protect their people. It happens in a few other places as well. Uh, but in most places, it's not happening. Uh, and of course, the federal government um, needs to do a lot more for all the governors. So, but it is, it is doable if there's a political will and if the authorities believe that our people are precious enough and are important enough to be protected. But a situation whereby we're viewed as, as nothing but lambs to the slaughter and tsuya, you know, and, uh, and uh, you know, meat to be carved up and uh, to, be, to be shared amongst foreigners, it, it, it almost makes me want to weep for what our country has come. This is the Nigeria that had Ekomog at one point in time, that liberated Sierra Leone, that liberated Somalia, that's Somalia, that liberated Liberia. We had soldiers in the Second World War in Burma, Nigerian troops fighting alongside the Allies against the uh, 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 alongside the Allies against the Nazis and against the Japanese. This is the this is their rich history of the Nigerian military, probably the most effective military on the African continent up until not too long ago. President Buhari himself was a great warrior when the Libyans, when the the Chadians came into Nigerian territory in 1983 and killed some of our people in Nigerian villages. Uh, on the border with Chad, and Shagari was president. It was President Buhari, General Buhari at that time, that led our troops into Chad and almost took the Chadian capital. I bet you didn't know that. I'm not sure if you were born at that time. He almost took the... Ch if I took the intervention of the Americans and the French to make a plea to um, uh, President Shagari at that time, that this man is about to take... So, 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 so we did that then. And we were all so proud of that. And he was recalled, and that's how they stopped him, and that's how they now put him in Joss as, as the GOC in Joss, because he was such an effective officer. What has happened to our troops since that time? The exact question I was about to ask. What has what happened to think? us? What do you think is happening? What happened? Well, I, you really, really I, I just don't know. But for me, it's, it's a very traumatic thing. I remember when, let me give you one more example. We, we tend to uh, demonize our leaders, forgetting that nobody's an angel. Mm. And nobody is a demon. Everybody has a little bit of dirt on them. Everybody has made mistakes. Someone like, someone like Abacha, let me tell you, I opposed Abacha's administration effectively. I was in exile then. We fought him. But let me tell you something Abacha did that made me so proud. When the Cameroonians came and occupied Bakasi, and Abacha got up, General Abacha got up and said, <laughs> they better leave. Otherwise, he is going to throw them out. And immediately, he mobilized our troops. 
I've never felt so proud. And he marched down there, led by a gentleman by the name of General Olatuji Olariwaju, a Yoruba man, led our troops down to our eastern border, to Bakasi, to prepare for battle against the Cameroons and the French. They had French troops in the trenches in Bakasi against our boys. And we were about to engage when the Americans now reached out and said to the French, listen, these guys mean business. They're going to fight for every inch of that territory. You better pull back. And they pulled back. The French pulled back, the Cameroonians pulled back, and we got Bakasi back. That is a military that I, I admire and I love so much. And that's a military that I wish we had today. And I think it's about political leadership. I think it's about political will. And I think that we need to rebuild our military and build them up again to ensure that they can do the right thing. When Jonathan had great success against Boko Haram, and he did, let no one fool you, he did, towards the end of, uh, before the election, mm. just before the election, he had to resort to bringing in a company called Executive Outcomes, um, led by a South African man. I've forgotten his name now. Um, strange name. A South African, a white South African guy. He's still alive. He's still there. And they came in. They brought in mercenaries who worked in collaboration with our troops on the ground. And it was very effective. They retook territory which was the size of the nation of Belgium in Europe. You know Belgium? Yeah. In Europe. That is the amount of territory they retook from Boko Haram. So it's doable. It's doable. And I look forward to the day that our troops can do this without any mercenaries, without any foreigners. And remember one more thing, I should tell you this, to show you the fighting capability of our men. Forget about what people say about our boys, that they're not good. They're damn good fighters when they're properly equipped. They're damn good at what they do. Let me tell you, when Jonathan did it, there was an international arms embargo on Nigeria. We couldn't buy arms anywhere. The Americans blocked the, buy, the buying of arms, and you need to ask why. It's a good question. <laughs> they blocked us. <laughs> they, <laughs> but now you, know, now you know who the real culprits of all this are. Somebody was funding the other side against our troops, taking our territory, funding them through nations like Saudi Arabia and so on and so forth, who are their allies. You know, Boko Haram come in. So it's a pattern, okay? And you are now telling us as a nation that we cannot buy arms. You will not allow us to buy arms anyway. International arms embargo. And you even the Israelis wanted to supply arms for us. You blocked it. You blocked our arms purchases everywhere. So what are we going to fight with? We had nothing. We had to resort to buying arms with cash, if you remember. And we did that. And we brought in foreign help through mercenaries because nobody else was ready to help us. The Ukrainians sold arms to us, by the way. They're the only country that did. And yet we managed to push these people back with such a collaboration. That is what we need today. You collaborate with anybody that is ready to work with you, even if it's a private company. Bring them in. Deploy them to the northwest. Deploy them to the northeast. Deploy the, 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 the might of the Nigerian military to the, to the forests of the southwest and to the south. Eliminate every single one of these foreign terrorists. Every single one of them. Move them out of our country. Seal our borders. Build a giant wall like the wall in uh, Game of Thrones. Okay? <laughs> you see Game of Thrones. Build a giant wall. And then we now sit down and we now iron out our differences amongst ourselves. Call in Namdi Kanu, call in Igbo, sit down and talk to them. Call in everybody, talk to everybody. You know, and the guys from the north, Sharif and all of them, call them in, you know. And uh, Shetima, call them in and let's, let's have a discussion as to how we're going to move forward so that the future of our people will be a better future. What we're faced with now is so daunting. And you know, it takes a dumb person not to understand the implications of what's going on. You need to be so dumb. Let, let me explain to you why. Let me, let me paint this scenario for you. Okay. Two, three years, four years, five years from now. And I do not want this. I do not wish this. And I pray I'm wrong. And if I'm wrong, I'll be the first to say so. And I pray God intervenes before then. And I trust that he will. But let me tell you what may happen. You may have a situation where this country is just a cauldron of fire. You have a situation where civil war, three years, three million Igbos were killed, including one million children. In this conflict that's coming, you will have at least 50 million people dead within a matter of years. The whole of the West African sub-region will be destabilized. You will have Nigerians in their millions in places like Ghana, places like Togo, places like Kutonu, will be third-class citizens in those countries. Those who can afford it will move to the West. That's if the West will have them. Those Some will move to America. All over the world, scattered everywhere. A scattered people with nothing, with nobody. And they will treat us like filth everywhere in the world. A country that was the greatest and strongest black nation on earth would now have been reduced to nothing. Why? Because we couldn't even manage our own differences. We couldn't seal our borders. We couldn't protect our women and children. And we're always squabbling and fighting one. Oh, I don't like Fanny Kai. I don't like Ayabelo. I don't like this. I don't like that. I don't like Buhari. I don't like Obasanjo. Uh, when, the, when uh, excuse me to use this language on this program, but when the shit hits the fan, you will like each other by force because everybody else in the world will hate you 
with perfect hatred and treat you with contempt. And I'm saying to you, this is what war does. We must never allow a war in this country again. We are already more or less at war, but it's with an enemy that we can still come together and deal with. But if the other one starts, that is brother against brother, or if it's based on faith, or if it's based on ethnic, uh, you know, e- um, ethnic nationality or whatever it is, and we start, such wars do not end easily. And the whole of the international community will laugh at us. First, they'll sell arms to us. They'll take pleasure in laughing at us. They'll come in. They'll set up refugee camps all over Africa for our people. And you know what? They'll just come and pick up the pieces, send in troops to seal off our oil fields and so on and so forth, put gunboats on the coast so they can secure their oil supplies and just allow us to kill each other. We do not deserve this. We do not want this. It must never come to this. The way to avoid it is to bury our differences, come together, work it out, and most importantly, fight the common enemy and stop them from destabilizing and destroying our country and causing us to turn on one another. Let's talk about how this administration is handling this security challenge. What do, how do you feel about the way the current administration is handling security? Well, what do you think? I mean, I, it, it's not rocket science for me to answer that question. What do you think? I mean, clearly something has gone wrong. And I'm not going to sit here. Look, listen, I've criticized them more than anybody else mm. over the last few years. What I will tell you, though, is this, that as bad as it might appear, and it is very, very bad, There are some voices in this government and in this administration, and yes, within the APC, that are very sensible. And I'll tell you this, a little story which a lot of people don't don't appreciate. And there are some voices and people in PDP that are not very sensible. We have sensible people in opposition, and we have people that are not sensible in opposition. We have sensible people in government. We have people that are not sensible in government and in the APC. So it goes all around. Now, let me tell you this. Uh, I, 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 you know, you, you must criticize when you need to criticize and oppose, and I will do so vigorously, and I've been doing so, and I will continue to do so. However, you must also give give credit where it's due. A few months ago, well, a few weeks ago, um, there was a major issue in this country, which would have led to a civil war. And Nigerians are very complex people. They should be rejoicing every day and celebrating at the fact that we didn't go off or we didn't go over the cliff at that time. What particular interest? Some Some appreciated it. Those that were right at the top, uh, who, particularly some of the elder statesmen, I won't mention names, who mm. reached out and thanked a lot of people for what the role they played in that conflict. But it, it would have led to a major crisis, and it would have started overnight. And nothing would have stopped it had it not been for the fact that, you know, there was an intervention. And I'm talking about a situation where we had a food embargo. Oh, on the um on the on the south mm. by by the northerners mm. and a very effective embargo as you know prices started rocketing in the south yes. um people people were suffering as a consequence of it to buy a goat in some parts of lagos was now one million naira from 100 it, and if it had gone on for another two weeks of course what would have happened next would have been people in the south would have started taking out taking it out on northerners in the south and there would have been a lot of tension and eventually it would have escalated into violence and what a lot of people don't know about that is that behind the scenes, clearly and openly, there was an implicit threat by elements within the North, led by groups that I will not mention their names here because we, we settled the issue. But I, I met some of these people mm. who had told us and told the government clearly that, listen, we're just not interested anymore. We are going to target and we are going to attack Southerners in the North. Why? Because during NSARS, we had X amounts of our people killed in the South. Mm. During the um, during the um, um, Shasha riots and killings in, in, in Ibado, we had X amount of it. And they had the names of all the people killed. They had how they were killed. All the details were there. And said, listen, we're just not interested anymore. This is what we're going to do. The embargo is in place. After a while, we will begin this process and we will target and we will attack. And of course, if that had happened, then there would have been counter killings in the south. And then it would have just escalated. Within a matter of days, it would have turned into something else. And what happened? The government had the presence of mind, I'll say the president, I won't say the government, to call in a young man by the name of Yaya Bello, younger than I am, he's about 45 or so on and so forth. And I saw this young man operate. He called me in simply because of my links with uh, Sunday Igbo, who is very, very close to me. And um, he needed Igbo on board. And um, he felt that I could speak with Igbo, which I did, uh, there and then. Igbo got on board the whole thing, that we don't want a crisis, we don't want violence. And what they asked for this young man, was simple and clear that can you give a guarantee that if this food embargo is lifted 
and our people, that is the northern people, come back to the south, supply food, because they had already withdrawn thousands of their people from the south. They were, they were leaving in droves because they knew what was going to happen. So if our people come back, just guarantee to us, give us your word that you will not target them that they will not be killed because they're defenseless and you know we have a duty to protect them Igboho gave his word in all credit to him there and then and that's how this crisis was stopped and who brokered it it was Yaya Bello. i was there and what happened next we negotiated with the, uh, the, the the northerners over the food embargo they had some demands we also made our own demands in terms of um in terms of um what the government needed to do about the Fulani's uh, uh, terrorists in our forests in the southwest and so on and so forth. And in fairness to President, uh, President Buhari, he issued that directive at the time that anybody carrying an AK-47 must be shot on sight. It was as a consequence of that. And what happened? At the end of the day, within three, four days, because there was talking, bridge building, communication between all sides, everybody, some of the governors of the southwest were approached and informed. They may not have been directly involved, but they were informed. There and then we called them on the phone. I won't mention their names. Other southern governors were involved. Other northern governors were involved as well. Everybody was carried along, but it was done covertly and quietly. Three, four days later, after a series of meetings, open meetings, these things were voiced at those open meetings. So it's not just, don't take my word for it. Go and look at the tapes. When we had the final meeting at Kogi State Government House, the things that were being said, and said with pain, and said with, with sincerity you know, and passion, okay, on all sides. And what happened in the end? We agreed. The embargo was lifted. Food started coming to the south. The threat of killing southerners in the north was dropped. Reprisals in the south, the threat of reprisal was dropped. And there we go, honky-dory, we're back to square one. We're all happy again and we all love one another again. And now we're only toying with our differences as a people and also with this foreign threat of foreigners coming in to kill our people. So what I'm trying to tell you is that here you have a situation whereby things could have escalated in a matter of days. We mm. pulled back from the brink. And the government did the right thing at that time. And we must give them credit for that. They didn't just sit back and do nothing. And we pulled back. And that's why I have so much respect for Yaya Bello. I have respect for Buni. And I have respect for people like Ugwai, uh, Sheima Kinde, Ayade, and a number of others. Bala Mohammed, Matawale in Zamfara. These are people that all made an input in all this. But primarily it was by Bello and it was Buni and they did an exceptional job. And it doesn't matter to me what party you're in, what your religious faith is, what region you come from. If you can bring peace, if you can bring peace and understanding and build bridges as equals, not as master servant, as equals, then I'm happy with, I'm happy to work with you. And that's the kind of leadership we need more and more of in this country. Okay. And that's how we'll pull back from the brink.